My name is Jim Granada. I'm the Dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs. This is the Hobby Hour. We are lucky today to have our first Hobby Hour guest in 2022, Representative Garnett Coleman. Today, we're gonna to talk about his career in Texas politics, his recent news about seeking reelection, and his opinions on the Texas political landscape. Let me also add a personal note. Um, aside for Governor Hobby, Representative Coleman is a key player in the development, the creation and development of the Hobby School, and we'll be forever grateful. Now, a little bit about him. Um, there's several things you can say in terms of what he's done, uh, but I'm gonna try and keep it short so we don't go into a three hour show. Um, first, he served as state representative of the House District 147 since 1991, so that's 30 years. Throughout his years of service, Representative Coleman has earned a reputation as a diligent leader in the area of healthcare, economic development and education. He is currently the senior ranking me member of the, of the Public Health Committee, as well as the chairman of the County Affairs Committee. Representative Coleman also served as a member of the House Select Committee for Mental Health during the 84th legislative session and the House Select Committee on Opiate and Substance Abuse during the 85th legislative session. Some of his most significant legislative accomplishments, and there are many, include joint authoring legislation that simplified access to children's Medicaid for more than 600,000 children in the state of Texas. It also helped secure an increase in 106, of 161.5 million for at-risk children for our, our child care services, something we call the CHIP program, which I'm gonna ask him about as we do this interview. Um, he's also helped secure, uh, he's also um, the chair of the legislative study group, a nonpartisan house caucus dedicated to the development of sound public policy. He's been chair since 2003. And he was elected to the position by more than 40 members, 40 members of, of the House. In addition, Representative Coleman has the honor of being a past chairman and current member of the Texas Le Legislative Black Caucus. He's, he was raised in Houston. He attended Howard University in Washington, D.C., and he graduated from the University of St. Thomas, cum laude, with a Bachelor of Arts degree. He also completed the prestigious Harvard University Senior Executive Program for State and Local Government. Welcome, Representative Coleman. And before I start my questions, um, those who want to ask questions on chat, I will try to get you in as we go forward, but you're welcome to ask questions as we go forward. So let me start by asking you this. Um, your family has been active in public policy and civic issues for many, many decades. Could you give us a little background on that? Well, you know, I, I call the, the, the 60s, uh, and particularly the time when uh, there was segregation where uh, black community didn't have much power, uh, the greatest era of civil rights leaders that existed. My father went to Fisk University uh, and at the same time that Martin Luther King went to Morehouse. Uh, so in HBCU and then he went from there to Howard Medical School, but he couldn't go to medical school in Texas. Uh, because you weren't allowed to go to the medical schools in Texas as a as a, a black person, and I think that shaped him and it shaped me to uh, understanding that it's government uh, that makes those changes for communities. Uh, and he was a leader in that aspect. He did it in a different way, though. Uh, he was he he taught us that you have to vote, that you should give money, you should raise money. You should be involved and you should tell people uh, what the needs are, but you don't have to be bombastic about it. I got that from my mother. <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where uh, the public sector was always important. Um, and, and, and the same applies to my mother's family. Uh, my godfather was part of the team that worked with uh, Thurgood Marshall uh, and the, he was the Houston professor at Howard Med School on segregation cases uh, to desegregate schools. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it, it's because that's what everybody did. There wasn't anybody who didn't do that. You know, that was the discussion around the table. Uh, so that, that drives you in, 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 in politics because you know that by being active in those issues, it makes change. Uh, and it's just the truth, just like other people being active in issues uh, makes change in the opposite direction. And, and I think that's one of the challenges right now is that the change that is going on is actually a retrenchment of that time of uh, when 
my father and others were advancing people and, and giving uh, and making sure that black people got a seat at the table in, in, in all of government. So what gave you, you decided to seek elective office at what point? Was it something you had an ambition for since you were in college? Was there some, I mean, obviously you're from a family that's very active, but what was well, it made that your ambition? Well, you know, I was lucky because like, uh, unlike a lot of people, I knew the elected officials that represented us. So, uh, and when I was at Howard, I, I did a, a, an internship with Mickey Leland uh, when I was 19. Uh, Anthony Hall, Craig Washington, Mickey Leland, and all of them were the first group under uh, voting rights law to go to the Texas legislature uh, and serve in the House. And uh, so those, you know, we call them Mickey, Craig, you know, it's just first names. Um, and but they, they, they made, they changed things. And I saw that as something e extremely important. And then my predecessor died in office. And so I sort of said this, and people wouldn't necessarily believe this, but I just said, well, if I'm gonna do this, let me do it now. Uh, I may not win, but even if I don't, it's okay. Uh, and I go work in government somewhere uh, in, a, in a, just a regular capacity. Uh, and so, so just one of those happenstances where it was a special election, it was only 30 days, um, it was something that could be done quickly. And the first thing I said is I'm not going to spend all the money we don't have, which we didn't have me, my wife and I, uh, on an election. And, and so, but it turned out okay. I was shocked as anybody else. And you were 29 years old when you were elected? Yes. Ter well, just turned 30. Just turned 30. So you reached the Texas legislature. You meet Bill Hobby. How'd that go? Your first couple of meetings with him. So. So, you know, I didn't, as much as I knew about the, the Texas legislature and the Texas House, I was still very scared about going to my first session. Uh, and it was a special session on school finance. And school finance is very difficult. But Governor Hobby was an expert in school finance, in the mathematics and policy of the public schools in Texas. So, uh, you know, of course I knew of him in the, in, in the Hobby family. Uh, he couldn't be in Houston and not know of him. Uh, so I called him, he was up doing stuff over at Rice at the time. Uh, and he, you know, he had just left being Lieutenant Governor. And I asked him, would he teach me, uh, sit down with me and tell me about school finance because I knew he knew it and I didn't quite understand it. Uh, and he did. And, and that was the start of, uh, you know, of a relationship of me, you know, understanding that he was a policymaker, you know, not necessarily a politician. And we, 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 we throw those terms around these days, but I also knew, uh, you know, his mother and that his, his father was governor of Texas. You know, these are, these are things that are important to those of us who look at, at be, being in government. Um, you know, who are the statesmen and stateswomen in government and what have they done? And, and so he was uh, lieutenant governor while uh, Mickey and Craig and all of them were in, in the House. And then Craig went to the Senate and served under lieutenant governor Hobby. So these are people that were, the, the, you know, the towers uh, in public policy around me that I grew up looking at. And, and so, so they had great influence on me. And, and we, you know, we don't have that many political families, just like I admire the Bushes, uh, th this for the same reason. It wasn't about the politics, it was about the policy. And, and so that's what I admire Governor Hobby for. And uh, when, when it came time to, to look at uh, the School of Public Affairs and they had changed the name of the Center for Public Policy to the Hobby, Hobby School, I mean, to the Hobby Center, for public policy, and then we developed the hobby school. This is very important because you know we have to remember the people who moved us forward. If somebody were to say, "Well, would Governor Hobby get elected today?" No, he wouldn't be elected lieutenant governor. And so it's very important that we honor the people who change things. The indigent care program in Texas is because Hobby passed it. 
We wouldn't have indigent health care without Governor Hobby, among many other things. Now, you've had a 30 year career, and let's focus on some of the main issues, you main policy challenges you, you have passed legislation and led the, led the efforts on. First, let's talk about the Texas Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program, also known as CHIP. It began in 1999, is that correct? Yes, I believe that's right. So what was the impetus and, and what, how did you go about getting the support for this? I mean, this is not an easy thing to get through, correct? So we have to remember that, that the, so first of all, Pete Laney was very, Speaker Pete Laney was very interested in children's health care. You know, the, the Clinton tried to do health reform. The booby prize for not getting health reform was passing on the federal level, the CHIP program. And then states could opt in to uh, the CHIP program. So we decided as the House, and I was a member, I was writing uh, uh, health and human services budgets on the Appropriations Committee and on the, the, the Health Committee. Uh, so I got involved in passing the legislation in Texas. So I was a, uh, an author of, uh, of the CHIP program in Texas, uh, one of the main authors. Uh, and then also Children's Medicaid. And, and so what we did was simplify how children and families with children enrolled into the Medicaid program, because that was the program that should, was decided to be seamless with CHIP. CHIP, you could have a higher income, but at a lower income, they were, you were in children's Medicaid. And so I'd been working on getting people health coverage from the day I walked in the legislature. Uh, and this was extremely important to me. I mean, and important to everyone, so I was one of these people who wouldn't take no for an answer. It, it, it just was gonna, it was gonna happen. Uh, and I think that just before that, I realized that, you know, that was, I didn't, I guess it can't, it was my passion, but it was because of watching my father uh, as a physician, uh, how he cared, how he thought of his patients. He was an OBGYN, but I was around doctors, uh, you know, growing up. And if you couldn't, get healthcare, well, what did you do? Right. And so insurance is what determined whether or not someone could get healthcare. It, it, it's just as simple as that. Right. So you follow up CHIP, which was done in 1999 with the Health Disparities Task Force in 2001. Was that just basically the monitor was going in CHIP or was, it, was the ambition much bigger than that? So here we go. This is much bigger than that because I started working on health disparities and uh, coverage uh, for people when Clinton was president and working with Surgeon General uh, David Satcher. And they had an initiative out of the federal government was 100% uh, uh, healthcare and zero disparities. And so by putting health disparities, so by putting the task force together, the idea was to integrate uh, the eliminating disparities into all of health and human services in Texas. Uh, and that's what it was supposed to do. And then so we created the Office uh, of Health Disparities uh, and started working on that process uh, in, in the early 2000s and starting actually in the 90s. So, so it's, it's one of those things that that was the issue. I mean, we knew it. I mean, we knew there was, uh, it, that, it, that healthcare was not fair. Uh, we, we knew that it wasn't it. So what do you do? What do you do? You have to go do something about it. Uh, and so that's how I, I looked at everything is that uh, we have to solve these problems because quite frankly, they're all remnants, uh, remnants of, uh, of uh, segregation. Right. So fast forward to 2011. You've got the 1115 Medicaid transformation waiver. What was that about? So uh, the, the legislature, I mean, the Congress had passed the, the Affordable Care Act, but Texas opted out, opted not to expand Medicaid. But a part of the Affordable Care Act, the states that didn't have a robust expansion of health care got a waiver to, uh, to prepare for a new group of people who were gonna be insured. So I got really involved as a member of the Public Health Committee. And, and of course it was money, so it was the Appropriations Committee. Uh, 
uh, in making sure that we passed the waiver, uh, and we did, uh, that would bring money in to, uh, to provide services in hospitals as well as uh, in offices. Uh, and with that, change how we delivered services. Uh, and it wasn't intended to be uh, something that gave health care to people. It was intended to shape uh, the, how health care would be provided. But it turned out, since we didn't do the expansion of, of Medicaid, it turned out that, that it served a purpose of providing care for individuals uh, for a period of time. So it was a lot of money. I mean, we're, we're talking about over five years, $27 billion. Uh, and uh, so I did a bill uh, that talked about what things would be in the 1115 waiver. Uh, and it, it covered a lot, of, a lot of areas, particularly mental health, uh, uh, particularly chronic conditions. Uh, and it, it, I worked with members of the Senate, uh, people like uh, Duncan and others out of, out of Lubbock uh, to, to, to make sure that we use that money to provide care in a way that it uh, would be for people who weren't insured before. Um, it's, a, it's extremely important. So we're focused. Oh, and we still have it today. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so, so that, but, so we don't have coverage expansion, but we still have it today. But this passion you have, it extended to foster children too, didn't it? Yes. So in 2007, what did you do that time? <laughs> well, <You're> busy man. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but that started when I was on the, I was writing article two, which was all of health and human services, which included foster care. And so when you go back to the 90s, uh, you know, we had the same problems uh, in foster care that we have now. We basically solved it, though, to some degree. Uh, and it was very important that children who age out of foster care were able to go to college and would have their college paid for, just like my children. So because they didn't have a parent, the state was their parent. Uh, so we had needed to offer them what it was that, uh, that we would offer any child. And so we did legislation that uh, made sure that college was paid for, for children who aged out of foster care, and also that their living expenses uh, are paid for. And right now over at U of H, they're doing a big initiative on uh, children that have aged out of foster care and um, housing and, and the like. And, and, and I, think, I think that's what started uh, most of those initiatives in, in the state. And also we were having a problem. We were having a problem with children uh, who were in uh, foster care, not necessarily in somebody's home, but in group-based foster care, and it just wasn't working. Uh, and, and as well as, uh, you know, the idea that people move children who were becoming adults, moved to a place where they were safe and healthy. Uh, we, we had problems and we believed in solving those problems. And we've summarized some of the healthcare initiatives you have sponsored and spearheaded. What do you think are the most important ones that you've been involved with? Is it all of them or is there some that are just really, you're just like, wow, this is so, one. Well, first of all, it's hard to differentiate between the impact of something. But the one thing I always did, and I, uh, I, I don't know why I did it that way. My colleague, Pete Gallego, used to say, you act like a statewide official. Uh, you, you, you don't act like a, a house member. I said, well, you know, there's so much to do. Uh, if you're going to do policy, you might as well do big policy. <laughs> so, you know, I said a little policy. Yeah. So, so, uh, so when I was going into the legislature at that time, there was a lot of discussion of mental health. Uh, and uh, the Scientologists, believe it or not, were trying to make end mental health care in Texas. And I, just when I went in, that, that big bill on, on mental health was being done. Um, and so I got involved and then I got appointed to the public health committee. Um, and so I worked on, on those things, but what was really important to me was that we expand health insurance uh, because I knew through mental health that if somebody didn't have insurance, that was the problem. They couldn't get care because they were not covered. 
So I started working on uh, mental health insurance parity, but then it became, and then also at that time, uh, expansion of healthcare was being done under another 1115 waiver and we didn't get there. And that was in uh, the early nineties. So we were a state that obviously didn't have people covered where other states did. Uh, and so I went in to work on, on that, worked on Medicaid managed care, making sure it was fair. So I wrote a bunch of Medicaid bills and I was working on that ever since. I've never stopped. Uh, and it was very important to me that people have access to health care. So that is a glue through the whole my whole service, which I think I would say culminated, that was 10 years ago, but has culminated with working with the Obama administration under uh, to, to create and pass the Affordable Care Act. There were 32 of us. Um, and so I was on the White House Working Group of State Legislators for Health Reform. And uh, things had been taken out of the law. Uh, and, and that bill put most of them back when Texas uh, Medicaid was stripped in 2003. So, so this is just something that I, I, I see it as a, a, a rights issue. Um, and it was very clear that other states were providing more services. We actually ended some services uh, under Craddock and, and, and under Perry. Uh, so, you know, we actually did retrenched on providing uh, services in Medicaid and healthcare. So what makes you and I who have state insurance uh, able, to, able to be well is that we have state insurance. We have health insurance. And so people out there that don't, uh, it's catch as catch can. Uh, and if we didn't have the energy care program, which I did an update on that Governor Hobby made sure passed, uh, we would have, those folks would have nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's different in different counties. So, so this to me is so very important because you can't get it, you can't, you can't get help for any illness, whether it's HIV, whether it's mental health, whether it's postpartum depression, uh, whether it's women's health uh, overall, uh, whether it's a sickle cell, uh, whether it's diabetes, it doesn't matter what it is. If you don't have health insurance, you're just SOL. Right. So I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it. You're, you're moving in this direction. What policy changes do you think still need to happen in Texas? I think it's basically insurance, insurance, insurance. Is that about right? That's correct. So, you know, because of what happened that states had to affirmatively act to do the Medicaid expansion because uh, Texas sued uh, and we lost that case on the federal level. So that's why we don't have Medicaid expansion. And what I wanted to do was finish my work. It, you, you know, it wasn't finished. Uh, so we've been fighting for that for the last 10 years and the state of Texas, unfortunately, has been brought, tried to bring the Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare down since the beginning. Uh, and the only way for it to work is that it come out of Washington DC instead of coming out of the state. Instead of the state requesting a Medicaid expansion, the state, the the federal government would need to uh, mandate a Medicaid expansion that is within the, uh, the law, passes Supreme Court muster, uh, and can do that. As a matter of fact, that's in the Build Better Act that's pending, uh, that we would expand Medicaid in the states that haven't done it. Uh, and that would be the law if we pass the Build Better uh, Social Services part of the Build Better Act. And so that would actually finish it. It would, in Texas, would not have to ask for it. Right. So you know that's really uh, it's it's still not done. Right. And so when you look at it that way, and you start talking about, well, is it done? No, it's not done. Uh, as a matter of fact, the problem is, it it should be done, uh, but people are still fighting against it and using the courts to undo it. But I, I believe that if we pass the Bill Better Act that has uh, you know, the child care uh, stuff in it, has these, but the 12 states, uh, the, excuse me, the, the states that don't have Medicaid expansion actually expand it 
from the federal government side, not from the state side, uh, uh, that that would end in that challenge that that we have. Um, and, and so I'd like to finish things and it's just not finished yet. Right, right. Well, I have all the questions for you, but we're starting to get, we're starting to get, um, the audience is starting to raise issues. These are I mean different things. I wanna to go to these because these are important to me and I think to you as well. The first one's from Texas State Representative John Rosenthal. First, he wants to express his sincere gratitude and respect to you for all you've done. And he's, as he says, the amount of work we know about that you've done, arguably even larger body of work behind the scenes. And he said he's benefited personally from your mentorship and leadership. So shout out to you from him. But he's got a question for you. Do you plan to continue actively mentoring and growing and developing staff and candidates and newer legislators like him to help us become more effective policymakers? Yes, I'm just a phone call away. <laughs> um, and, and so what, what I hope to do is continue that uh, I, I've created a think and do tank, the Center for Public Policy, uh, Center for Civic and Public Policy Improvement, and that's going to be the goal of that of that think tank. But what what happens is people should not walk away if they have a, a level of expertise. And so as much as I can, without it getting you know getting in the way, uh, I, I want to be accessible to. Uh, members of the House and Senate that would like to know what I know. Um, it, 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 otherwise, it's wasted. It's just absolutely wasted. And why do all this? And then, and I did it, I, you know, I'm a student of, of the policy process and will continue to be. As a matter of fact, when I worked on the Affordable Care Act, I became a student of the Congress. Um, and it, it's extremely uh, interesting uh, that I did a lot of federal work as a as a state legislator. Uh, it so it it I, I hope to continue to do those kinds of things, John. Uh, and uh, it, I I I, appreci I I want to make sure that people understand. But you know, people have to make their own way. But if somebody asks me a question, I'm going to answer it. Uh, and and sometimes the rules will change and things like that. But it's just like me asking Governor Hobbs why about uh, school health school. Uh, you know, the, about uh, it's making sure that we did school finance. He knew. Why go to somebody else? He knew, you know, and I think that's the whole point. Uh, we have many people out here who know, um, and we should take advantage of them and not send them out to pasture just because they left. Reach out one more time. One more question, and we'll go back to some I'd like to ask you. Um, so you were actually, when you were first elected, you guys were the majority, Democrats were the majority, right? Correct? Yes. We so were the majority in the House until 2003. Right. So that you lived through that transition. So the question from a member of the audience is, how can a minority party, minority party member stay relevant when you are, have a one-party state government? And how do you get your initiatives on the agenda? Obviously, you've done so. But what's the strategy? How, did, how were you able to do such things? Well, first of all, it has to be good public policy. So you can't just go do stuff that's bad public policy. Uh, and so when uh, Speaker Laney was, was speaker, we did a lot of uh, pieces of everybody's policy. So it could be conservative. It could be very, very progressive. Uh, it, it could be, it was a mix of things. Uh, and so policy is not Republican and not Democrat. It depends on the goals and objectives. However, today, in terms of the policy harm that is done, it, it is expanded. Uh, and the activist side uh, of the Republican Party uh, has gone as front and center. Uh, and it, it really is a challenge. Although, I, like you said, I continue to get things done. Last session was very tough. It's absolutely, uh, you know, there, it's COVID was a problem too, but they became, I think, combated from a policy perspective. The policy that you passed really couldn't do much. Uh, and the policy that we passed as a legislature did a lot to go in the opposite direction. So it was very similar to 2003 uh, when a, a lot of what, what I would call retrenchment policy was passed uh, in that 2003 session. But you know what? There are times to do things different ways. 
So, you know, when Craddock was speaker, I was part of the, the leadership of the opposition, uh, you know, for six years. <laughs> That's all I did. Um, and, and I knew that, that that was the value at that moment. But when it came to 2009 and we elected uh, Speaker Strauss, I said, you know, it's time for me to get back into actually passing policy. So it, that, that's what I concentrated on uh, is actually getting policy passed. And so you become a lot quieter when you're doing that. Uh, you make relationships across the aisle, but also in the Senate. Uh, and so you make sure, I used to carry a lot of John Monford bills uh, so who is going to kill John Monfort's bills? And I used to care. I, I worked very closely with uh, Governor Ratliff. And who's going to kill Governor Ratliff bills? Uh, work. So it's, it's that kind of thing. And if it's good public policy, you know, it'll 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 ride its own way. Uh, however, finding good public policy has not been one of the objectives. Before we close on this issue. We've been talking about health care and health health issues, health policy. Um, one more question that I have, but some of the audience has as well. Is Medicaid expansion possible in Texas, say, in the next dec this decade? As long as that's a touchstone for Texas and for statewide Texas politicians and Republicans control the House and the Senate, the answer would be no. Because... Texas was the leader in trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. And as long as they have the power to keep that from happening, uh, they will use it. And, and I, I hate to say that, I was talking to some people, you know, everybody thought, well, you know, okay, you know, these folks are working on this uh, and it's gonna happen. I said, no, it's not. I said, no, it's not. It's, it's, too, it, it's too much of a banner for people like Abbott who did the suits. You, you know, the same, it, it just, it just too, it's too much. And we lead that fight uh, across the country. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a conservative fight and it's against uh, government making a difference. I guess, except if it's about uh, dealing with the woman's right to choose government, they believe that it makes a difference for government to get in the way. So I, I, think, I, I think that that is why it's so hard to change. Very, very difficult to change because as long as there's a Republican governor, except if it was Bill Ratliff uh, or a Lieutenant Governor and probably even a speaker, uh, I, I predict that they'll continue to sue on the Affordable Care Act going forward on the federal level. Just like, uh, Paxton said, I, I, I'm going to consider continue to sue. All right. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about your work on criminal justice reform. In 2017, you passed the Sarah Bland Act, which ensures that all officers receive de-escalation training, require robust and clear traffic stop data, provides a process for complaints on each traffic ticket, and outside investigation of jail deaths, and it provides improvements in inmate safety. It also requires a good faith effort to divert people suffering from mental health to treatment instead of jail. Can you share the behind the scenes process of that thing from start to, to finish? Sure. So I'm chairing the County Affairs Committee and I realized we had jurisdiction mm. over those issues of criminal justice. People in the past had not used the County Affairs Committee for that purpose. And so when Sandra Bland died, and, and also the County Affairs Committee has uh, jurisdiction uh, over its uh, state jails, I mean, excuse me, county jails, uh, and over, the, the, over that process. So I was, over, I was at a, friend, my, my, a funeral, and I was, my wife and our friends were, you know, we were standing around talking, and I realized, I said, you know, I have to do something about this. And I have a committee that can do something about this. This was in 2015. And so we started doing hearings to write a bill that would deal with the, the actual things that happened to Sandra Bland. And that might've been too much of a limit 
but it, 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 it had to do with mental health. I've been working on mental health. It had to do with state jail. I mean, county jails. I've been working on county jails. Um, it, it had to do with something that I experienced growing up. I mean, you know, people wonder why uh, Black people are afraid of cops, because you better be afraid. At least that was my experience. Um, and, and so, but I thought that was a situation that just was uncalled for. Um, and, and I knew it was uncalled for. So we started with dealing with mental health issues, but at, and because that, that obviously was an issue. I mean, you know, if you think about it, we, we it's it, having somebody killed by a, a, a peace officer that's mentally ill is common. And, and so I've been trying to, you know, fix that part and also making sure that jails or county jails are safe, that we uh, eliminate suicide. But what it came down to is if racial profiling, uh, a, a, an interaction between the police and someone in a car is a dangerous situation for both the police officer and the person in the car, and particularly if they're of color. So to me, it was one of those things that I knew if I started it in 2015, I'd be living it. Uh, and I started in, in August of 2015, right after the session, I'd be living it for forever, but particularly for that two years into the 2017 session. And, you, you know, it was a big deal. And I'm not afraid to take on big deal things. Um, and John Whitmire was extremely uh helpful with this because, I mean, shoot, he shared the, the Senate Criminal Justice Committee. I mean, he, you know, he knew this stuff, but also there was help uh, from Abbott, uh, from Strauss, from uh, Patrick, from different people. And we were able to get things in the bill that people really don't know. And that the, the idea of Data. So you do a lot of data stuff at the hobby school, but the data is what we got past when it came to dealing with how do you change uh, stops and how do you change the outcome. And so what we did was make sure that the data was done by the state and it was done in a scientific way, as you, you, you like to talk about all the time, uh, that it's based on uh, the rate of stop, not the raw stops, and what happens when people are stopped, and is that racial profiling? Well, the deal is, yes, it is, but that's not the definition of racial profiling in Texas, so we changed the definition, and now we collect that data, and that's what's going to take us forward in dealing with the, uh, the, the evidence that uh, there is a disparity a huge disparity in what happens, particularly to people of color uh, in a traffic stop and, and what, what happens from there. And Sandra Bland case was very, very demonstrable of that. I mean, the idea that they, he threw the woman on the ground, come on now, that's just not us. And the idea that she didn't turn on her blinker and she got put in jail uh, and then committed suicide. So, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think she committed suicide. I, it's been proven that she committed suicide, but, you know, I'm skeptical, to be honest with you. Um, uh, to me, I, I, I just think that shouldn't have been the case that uh, suicides in jails happen like that. So that's when we did a lot of changes in how jails monitor patients that commit suicide. But the biggest deal uh, has been to uh, provide guidance to local police departments, uh, state uh, DPS and uh, county sheriffs uh, about what is good public policy when it comes to policing. Uh, we've done, we did something nobody had ever done and, and still nobody's ever done. And that's the, the, the idea that uh, it covers statewide. It's a statewide policy for all 2,500 plus police departments in the state. So it's a blanket policy. And that's what's different. That's what makes it big. It's not just the DPS. It's not just, uh, you, you know, the, it, the, the constables. It's not just the sheriffs. It's everybody. It's the Houston Police Department. It's everybody. And that's a big deal. And we were the first state to ever do that. 
by the way. That's, I want to interrupt you for a second. So that, so states are laboratories for policy, right? It's a, fed, a federal system. So here's this initiative. So have you been contacted over time by members of other legislator, legislatures to say, we want to try this, give us some advice on this. Has that happened? A lot of that happened now? Yeah, it happens. I mean, it happened on healthcare. I used to uh, chair the NCSL Federal Healthcare Health Committee. Uh, and I was part of the Reforming States group with Millbank Memorial Fund. I, you know, the, I, do, I did a lot of stuff like that, I, it, it, particularly in the 90s. Um, and yeah, we, we, tra we uh, es exported policy and we gathered policy, particularly from smaller states, who was easier for them to make that policy and we could scale it up uh, in, in Texas. So yeah, no, the people in, in California, they were really shocked that we were able to get the things done with the Sandra Bland Act. I mean, all over the, the country, they said, how did you do that? Uh, because it's significant policy. People tried to play it down as not significant policy, uh, it, but it is. And so I think a lot of that had to do with passing the bill. Uh, you know, make it be about, be about mental health so nobody focuses on the criminal justice reform pieces in it. Um, and, and so I, I think that that was a tactic to get it to get it passed. So it, it's like anything else. Uh, you use those tactics. Yeah, but I've spoken to people in uh, law schools and different uh, police departments and um, in about all the things that that we had, you know, we did in that bill. And it's really a bill when it was originally filed that if you follow that blueprint, wherever you are, uh, it puts a huge dent in uh, the challenges uh, of uh, criminal justice reform. Is it a be all end all? No. So there are things we didn't get like dealing with uh, the stops. We still haven't dealt with pretext stops and investigative stops. That, that's a big deal. And, and the reason it can be done is because the Supreme Court, different Supreme Courts have found that it's constitutional for a police officer to pull you over without probable cause. People don't know that. And in Texas, you can be jailed, obviously, Sandra Bland for a traffic violation. So okay. these are things that, that, that need to be solved, but, but they need to be solved. Uh, there needs to be a Supreme Court case. And that's why we did this data because there needs to be a Supreme Court case that repeals that interpretation of the Fourth Amendment. So yes. So based on what I just heard, it looks like the Texas legislature is probably not going to be able to move in that in the direction you wanted to in terms of that reform. Is that is that a good? Yeah. Guess? Look, after after uh, the gentleman in Williamson County uh, who was killed with the knee on his neck, after uh, George Floyd who lived in my district and lived in the CUNY homes a mile from where I live and where I grew up, I mean the idea that with that heinous situation. We still weren't able to get much more uh, in the, the se that session of the legislature. I, I, I think it tells a story that it's going to be very difficult. And the fact that people like Abbott doubled down on policing um, and also Donald Trump doubled down on policing uh, and you know protect the blue and the like, well, who's going to protect us? from the people in blue. Yeah. And, and so I, I think it's still not done. We, we, we did some things that can, can, can make it happen, but I think we need to respect the police. I mean, they have a very hard job and it's a dangerous job. Uh, and it's just, you know, one of the things I learned doing the Sandra Bland Act is to step in their shoes. And I want them to step in mine because I experienced this. I mean, you, you know, I, I started driving in the seventies, you know, it, you know, you saw that in the, in the Houston Chronicle about Joe Campos Torres thrown in, in, in Buffalo Bayou and with handcuffs on. The Houston police were the worst. The big deal in the Houston police is when Lee Brown became police chief and changed policing to community-oriented policing. But before that, uh, you, you know, essentially, unfortunately, uh, under other mayors, uh, it was the Gestapo. And that's a remnant of Jim Crow South. So we could go on and on about that.
Right. It was meant to be an enforcer of the status quo. Again, lots of audience questions. I have to, this one, you may want, you may want to avoid answering, but I have to ask you. This, That's the, okay. the, the following question is this. As you know, the race for your house view is highly contested. And I'm curious if you're considering endorsing any candidates in the primary. And then they ask, why are I not? So you're on the hot seat here. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, so first of all, when I ran, uh, I self-selected to run. And uh, there were other people, there were 11 people in the special election, 11. So when you think about it, I think, I think the people should make those decisions. I'm not here to make a decision for the people. I decided to walk away from, from, from being the state representative. And so a candidate like me at that time, there were other people who were deemed more ready to be the state representative than me. And the people made a different decision than, than who was endorsed by uh, people who, who, who have real uh, authority, like Craig Washington endorsed Judon Boney uh, and, and others. So, so I think that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wanna put my thumb on the scale. Uh, and that's something that I'm trying to avoid doing. Um, and I, I don't think I should, choose the next representative. That's just not my role. I think right. democracy has to work. Because what it really does is it penalizes people who aren't as well known as other people. We should use forums, we should use debates, uh, we should use uh, all of those things uh, to decide who's gonna be uh, the, the, you know, the nominee and then uh, the state representative. We know it's gonna be a Democrat. No doubt about it. Uh, and it's likely to be a woman. So we know that. So, so going forward, I think those are, I think having a, a woman elected uh, to this seat is a very important thing. If, if that's what's happened, what happens. Your vantage point, what are the major challenges facing Houston, Texas? What are the things you really want to address? We need to finish our rail plan. We, we, we will sprawl and, and there's no way to solve the traffic problem. So when Bob Lanier, you know, who uh, is Bob, who was a Bob Lanier chair there, when they killed rail, I was still for rail. I was still for an expanded transit system uh, and bucked the system at that time. Uh, and still it, now it's changed because of Lee Brown. But, but I think that's where we're behind as a city. We, we, you can't get to an airport. It will happen uh, in the district that I represent now to hobby, but you, you, you go to Chicago and get to the airport on rail. You can go to uh, LA and get to the airport on rail. It's putting in, you can go to DC, you can go to New York. You can, you can go anywhere else with large cities in the country and move around with, with public transit. And I think if we're going to continue to grow the way we grow, and even though people say, well, that's not the most important thing. Yes, it is, because we can't continue to grow if the city remains congested internally and externally in, in, in the region. If we're, we're, you know, we're going to uh, seven, eight million people in the region and, and, and greater, uh, you just can't do it. And I know that sounds like, you know, some people say, well, you know, why are you interested in that? I said, because. If you don't have any money, you don't have a car, how are you gonna get around? And even if you have money, you have a car, what are we gonna do about air pollution? Everybody noticed when uh, COVID came and everybody stayed at home, how blue the sky was. I mean, it's, it's just clear. <laughs> so, so, you know, everybody was like, oh, the sky is blue. <laughs> yeah. So, so th those are the types of things. And then also, uh, you know, looking at what we do with planning not zoning, but planning in our city uh, using special districts like uh, tax increment reinvestment zones and municipal management districts and county improvement districts uh, to improve inner city, uh, but also improve the near in suburbs uh, and the far out suburbs. So I did a lot of municipal management district legislation and uh, 
TIF TERS legislation because I think they've had real value. Uh, and, and so that's something that most people don't know I work on. I worked on it. Uh, you know, I passed the downtown management district, the test the midtown management district, the uh, Houston Southeast management district. And these are tools uh, for, for development and for, for guiding what happens uh, in the city. So it shifts away from the things you hear about in the legislature totally to how do we prepare for the future uh, in a place that's growing exponentially uh, and it's going to have a lot of people. It's just the state, when I got elected, was 18 million people. It's, it's almost 30. So Houston was 1 million and the region was like three. You know, it's almost seven. So, so you, we, we have a, an increase in population and we have to deal with that uh, in a real way across the board, uh, whether it's in public health, uh, whether it's in uh, providing health care, whether it's in transportation, uh, whether it's making sure that people will continue to want to move here. Uh, and that's about housing affordability, quite frankly, that's the deal. That's why people move here. So th those are the things that I think that have to happen in Houston for us to have a clearly, a clear place in the future uh, that is as robust as our past. This ties into a question that one of the members in the audience asked, and you're talking about Houston, an urban setting, but you've been chair of county affairs. Can you explain the similarities of urban and rural Texas in terms of policy and challenges? Sure. So first of all, the largest county in Texas is Harris County. The county affairs committee deals with all 254 counties. And just because it's a county doesn't make it rural. Ask Rodney Ellis. So the deal is that policy, counties just don't organize under uh, a, a home rule circumstance like cities, but they do exactly the same things in the unincorporated areas. In Harris County is the largest county with uh, the most unincorporated areas, just about half of our population in the Houston area, it doesn't live in a city. So when you start looking at rural counties, their biggest challenge is that they can't raise much money through taxes. We can, because we have property that's worth a lot. In those counties, uh, you could tax all day long and still not raise a lot of money. And so the things that uh, happen in counties that are not in cities, uh, they, they don't happen in the way it happens here. Like they don't have robust uh, county indigent healthcare. They don't have uh, planning and zoning, but planning in particular, uh, in, in when you think about uh, criminal justice reform or you think about health, health, uh, they don't have the money to do those things. And, and, and that's what happens in rural areas. They don't have the money. And so we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that counties could get money to do their roads, to do their bridges, uh, to, to do jail uh, reform, and we help pay for it. Uh, that uh, we keep in mind that if it's a rural county and they don't have a lot of people, they may have a lot of land, uh, it's very difficult for, for them to make the changes. So it makes Texas unequal. Uh, so large urban counties can, can do certain things, but uh, medium sized and small rural counties cannot. And, 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 and that's what we, you know, we have to understand that's why county affairs was so important to me. And it, you can do the same things you can do in urban affairs, in county affairs, not like you can't. Uh, but I've always been interested in rural health care because when Pete Laney was speaker, I did health care for everybody. I mean, at rural, uh, urban, it, it didn't matter. Uh, and so in writing, keeping the, the Indigent Care Act going, uh, it was very important that rural Texas be served as well. Um, and so I, I've spent a lot of time in my service making sure we never leave rural Texas out, that we, that we never do. Because for my community where I live and for black people, we might as well be rural. We have the same problems, access to health care, uh, you, you know, challenges that have to do with education, uh, education. Uh, you know, Texas was not a place where rural people got higher education in the beginning. And a lot of things that were done were to, to actually 
move people in rural areas into higher education. My father was on the Texas A&M Board of Regents, and that was a big deal because it was about rural education. Um, and the reason why tuition uh, in the schools that were created in Texas was so low, it was so everybody could get an education. It just happened to benefit everybody. Not, and, and so I think that these are the things that, 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 that make policy works for different groups of people. It could be the same, same policy. Uh, it's just that people don't recognize that in, in, in rural Texas, they need those things as much as anyone else. They need uh, the, the Affordable Care Act. By the way, <clears throat> I'm one of those people that came from out of town that went to a Texas con from Illinois. And the difference in tuition between Illinois, which you would think would be a state that would subsidize things in a big way, my tuition at AM was Texas AM was just so much lower. And I was I was stunned, but it's nothing. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, when I got to the legislature, uh, it was $26 a semester hour. And it was in, I can't remember exactly the year, 2000, 2005, something like that, when we could have quote unquote tuition dereg that allowed uh, in universities to uh, increase tuition. But what people don't know is what happened is money was taken out of those universities and they had to make it up by raising tuition immediately. Right. Right. And we didn't have a system of scholarships. We didn't need it because people could work a part-time job at school like U of H. Somebody could work a part-time job and pay their own tuition, particularly when it was $4 a semester hour. Right. Now you have to have a scholarship. You have to have uh, people, uh, you know, it, 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 it changed everything. Um, and that's a challenge. Because what that does, is it made it equal. If you were a black person and poor, you could do a part-time job. If you're a white person and poor or, or uh, blue collar or whatever the case, a family or rural, you could afford to go to college. These are things that people could afford to do. And that's what changed Texas. But by making tuition so high, it has not, it, it doesn't allow people to do what it is that they need to do uh, to take advantage of the need for uh, undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees uh, in robust tier one universities uh, and, and to be able to afford it. In the remaining minute or so that we have, I've got this final question or quest, two questions really, it's two parts. So you've been in legislature for 30 years. You announced in November that you would not seek re-election. What factors influenced your decision? And more importantly, what's next for you? Health was a big part of it, but also disgust. I mean, you know, last session was really bad. I, I can't explain and, and, and tell people how bad it really was. Um, and it's that kind of atmosphere where I, I couldn't get anything done. Uh, and I passed bills, but you know, they didn't do as much. And as a matter of fact, we passed a lot of bills that don't do anything. And I was very disappointed in that. It's a change in the era that I went in. It changed tremendously. You know, we did public policy. It, 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 we, we weren't doing public policy. I don't know what we were doing. So, so that's a problem. But my health is, why well, continue to basically kill myself uh, and I, I can't necessarily get good public policy passed at all. Um, so at the end of the session, um, I, I, I ended up getting part of my uh, leg amputated. Um, and it, it just said to me, let some, you know, somebody else needs to go in and do this. I fought 30 years and particularly in the last 20, to try to keep good public policy going. And I just didn't have the, I don't have the energy to fight it for another 10 and 20. And it could be 10 or 20 years before uh, there's a, a balanced legislature. Uh, it, 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 and, and that's just the truth of the matter. Um, and I hate to say that, but it's the truth of the matter. Right. And what am I gonna do next? 
Well, I created uh, like my think and do tank, but I would like to, as, as Rosenthal, I would like to have value somewhere and lend my expertise that I learned over the last 30 years uh, to teach other people about the realities of government. Because when you're on the ground and it is very, and particularly electoral uh, politics, when you're on the ground doing it, it's experiential. Um, and my father was a, knew a whole lot of stuff, man. I'm gonna tell you, he was, and what I always wanted him to do was teach. And he died too soon to be able to do it. He died at 64. So he would have been great teaching a public policy course and doing lectures about how do you change things and not be elected. Those are the kind of things that we don't hear from people. Uh, and it's not taught in school. So I, I think there's a lot of influences where I, you know, I, I, could, I could work in, uh, in, in higher education to make a change in, in both healthcare, uh, the understanding of what public policy is really about uh, and, and, and how it's done. And, and, and I think that's important, uh, that, uh, really important. So I want to spend this time doing that. And, um, and, and, and this sounds terrible. People are going to say, God, you're so crass. Yeah, maybe make a little money. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, not that. <laughs> yeah. So because, you know, I think it's very important that people not use their office to make money. But if that makes it, you know, a sacrifice. Um, and people wonder why we, we have things going the way they are. Well, the why is you either have to be independently wealthy uh, or retired to be a legislator that can truly pay their bills. Because who's going to hire you and you don't work all the time? Right, right. Well, this has been great. We could talk for a long time here, but I do want to thank you, Representative Coleman, for participating in the, in the Hobby Hour, the first one of this year. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, for those of you out there, uh, Next Hobby Hour will be with Ambassador Chase Untermeyer. It's scheduled for February 15th at noon. Be sure to follow the Hobby School on social media for more information regarding that. And again, Representative Coleman, thank you. Chase is a great guy. When he worked for Vice President Bush and he, his, his family and he and his sister, they have been uh, very active. And, and they're the old school, uh, good public policy Republicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Take care.